morning, Year 10. Hello, welcome to Session 4, um, where we're looking at English Language Paper 2. So we're looking at your actual writing. After today's lesson, I want you to write your article. Write the whole thing. The whole first draft. And then you're going to send it to me, and I'm going to give you some feedback. So today we're going to look at feature writing, opinions, viewpoints, perspectives. You need to be opinionated and entertaining. Okay, so we're going to actually read someone else's article and we're going to analyze it. So before we do that, I'm going to get rid of my face. Bye bye for now. Um, I want you to have a look at these four people. I'm going to pause. Uh, I want you to pause the video uh, and think, um, have a think about what kind of things they might write, how they might write them. Uh, based on literally what they look like or maybe what you already know about them. So pause the video and have a little think. Okay, have you had your little think? Excellent, jolly good. Okay, uh, let's go through them one at a time. The one on the left here, the far left, with the white hair, his name is uh, Jeremy Paxman. He used to present Newsnight and as you might expect he's going to have quite serious political views um, he's a bit older isn't he so he looks like he probably knows what he's talking about okay next to him holding up a sign that says us uh, the lovely katie hopkins i'm being sarcastic she's not lovely at all she makes her living out of being really rude about people really rude she causes a lot of offense um she's highly opinionated she has very controversial views um and in fact people do enjoy reading um about her very offensive views on things um she's actually got into trouble a few times for being so offensive okay the chap holding the axe is not a psychopathic serial killer his name actually is charlie brooker and he writes about tv and film and celebrities and he kind of rips them apart he you know, he does a, a good tv show called tv wipe um or he used to and he's written quite a lot of amusing articles for for newspapers where he just tears people to shreds uh, the crazy looking lady on the far right with her typewriter is uh, called Caitlin Moran and she has very strong opinions about lots of women's issues. Um, these four people make their living by writing. They are writers and they earn jolly good money doing it too. Um, so being opinionated about something and being able to write about it is a very good skill to have. Um, so Caitlin Moran is the one we're going to look at. I have um, uploaded to Show a Homework and Google Classroom um, a PDF of Caitlin Moran's article that we're going to read. It's called Homework Should Be Banned. She wrote it a few years ago, but it's, it's very well written. It's relevant. Um, I've also sent you this table that we're going to use to annotate the article. Um, SGLM, so structure. Uh, grammar, lexis, which just means words, and uh, meaning. Number four is meaning. Okay, um, so first thing we're going to do is actually um, do a bit of research on who Caitlin Moran is. I think if you're going to read something by someone, it's always quite nice to find a bit of, about them um, because you will have she's going to be presenting you with a very strong opinion and if you know a bit about her um, then it will help you to understand perhaps why she has that opinion that she has. So you're watching this online, you've obviously got access to the internet so pause the video. Five to ten minutes, do some research on Catelyn Moran and I want you to answer the questions um, on the screen. Pause the video, off you go. Okay, you done? Okay, so hopefully you found out about her upbringing. Uh, she was one of quite a few kids, didn't have much money. Um, they were all crammed into one house. They lived in the Midlands. Um, she was homeschooled. She didn't do very well at school. Um, she got into trouble. Um, she didn't go to sixth form. She didn't go to university. She left home quite early, quite young, sort of 15, 16 years old, went down to London and just marched into um, the office of Melody Maker, I think, music magazine, and said, give us a job. I'm really good at writing, give me a job. Um, and they gave her a job, and she um, had made her living, to begin with, reviewing bands, and she had a bit of a crazy life, living um, 
in different flats in London, watching bands, staying up all night, um, having a good time. Um, she's written a couple of books. One of them is called How to Be a Woman, which is quite a, a good feminist tome uh, for when you're a bit older. Um, she's got kids now. Um, she's kind of settled down. She's a regular con contributor to the Times um, newspaper, magazine. So now you know that about her, how might that affect her writing style? Do you think she's going to be one, uh, do you think she's going to try not to offend people? Do you think she's going to be um, kind of kind of conservative in her views? Or do you think she's going to be a bit out there? Do you think she's going to care what people think about her? Or do you think she's just going to say what she believes? Shall we read her article and decide for ourselves? Let's do that. Okay, so I've sent this to you. Um, but I'm going to put it up on the screen here as well. Let me make it nice and big, and then we can read through it together. Okay. Why homework should be banned. I might get rid of my face for this. Now, I'm not one for craven populism. I dare to say the unsayable. In my time, I've suggested some pretty contentious things, that jam is horrible, that fish are evil, that ketchup shouldn't be kept in the fridge, and that Father Christmas is the sexiest man alive. But this week, I'm going to say something that I confidently expect will win 100% support. I cannot imagine a single person disagreeing with me because it is this. We should ban homework. If one thing happens this year, it should be a concerted campaign to eradicate this illogical, damaging, pain-in-the-neck institution once and for all. It is an invention universally loathed, and it is slightly less popular than mouth ulcers. For children, homework is one of the classic immortal foes, up there with vegetables, darkness, teeth cleaning and bedtime. Parents, meanwhile, are doubly enraged. As former children themselves, parents can't believe this homework stuff has come round again, this time with the added top spin of you now being the poor sap that has to haul the kids in from the playground and make them care about Richard II on one side of A4 paper, even as your offspring scream, I hate you, I'm too tired to do this and I want to die. Finally, should parents and children wish to round on the people who have given them the homework, the teachers, they would find that teachers are the ones who hate homework most of all. Teachers are all like, don't have a go at us, we'd kick homework in the nuts if we could. Teachers loathe homework. It's yet another round of projects to be set, handed out, nagged over and then marked. Homework for kids basically means homework for teachers too. And everyone is quite right to hate it, for it makes life far worse than we had ever imagined. Look, these are days of rocketing child obesity, anxiety and emotional disorders. Prescriptions for tranquilizers for children have gone through the roof. I don't think I'm being too fanciful to suggest that as soon as children complete their seven hour long academic day, they should be free to run around in the park muck about with their friends and have a chance to interact with their parents, not have their lives centred around screaming, I hate you, I'm too tired to do this and I want to die. And this would obviously improve the physical and mental health of British children immeasurably. When else are they going to do the, all that running around and being happy that we keep saying they need to do? The winters are long, they've got homework until 8pm and then they've got that big history project over the weekend. Homework means our children never really leave school. Even when they're at home, they're still strapped to that bulging rucksack of folders. They're still on deadlines, they're still producing. And whilst that's never fun for any child, for some it's utterly devastating. If you know in your bones that academia is not for you, then those final hours of homework mean you've spent your entire waking day that you feel doing stuff that you feel a failure at. You have no time to go out there and find the things that you might excel at and that give you joy and change your life. 
You could be helping your mum mend the clutch on the car, or being taught how to cook by your dad, or hearing the record that makes you form a band, or spending five hours obsessively practising free kicks with your mates. Instead, it's that sad chair at the kitchen table and the slow pen across the pages as your heart revolts and sometimes breaks. I loathe my children's homework with a passion. When they come home from school, I want that time to be ours. I want my children. How many hours do we have left of their already dwindling childhood? How many more of these ultra vivid years do we have when we can spend an evening walking along the river, visiting Nan, learning how to do magic tricks, reading stories? It's something that we will all remember forever, or that might even become their future. That my children spend these evenings exhaustedly weeping over a cardboard model of a neutron, which will just get chucked into some cupboard at school, and which doesn't even count in their exams, makes me feel a sad and desperate fury. And not least, because of the final awfulness of homework, that my kids are the lucky ones. Homework just about works for them because they have a calm house and parents who have the time just about if we forget that I actually wanted to go and listen to cereal while having a hot bath to help them. But for those children who are not lucky, who live in a chaotic house, who have parents who are busy or who are gone, homework is the cruelest reminder yet that the biggest factor in most children's educational attainment is, over and over again, their parents' education and class. It is often the final blow to the already struggling. So, let's call homework what it really is. It's not homework, it's a parent test. It's a life vampire. It's a future heart attack. It's emptied our playgrounds and panicked our children. It puts work in the home and I wish it death. I hope the biggest dog in the world comes and eats it. Wow, if you wanted an opinionated piece of writing, Caitlin Moran just gave it to you. Now that is her opinion and she makes some very powerful points in that piece of writing. If we just go back to the main thing again. So she says why homework should be banned. Okay, so she starts off by saying that she um, is quite happy to say unsayable things. She's quite happy for people to disagree with her, but she's convinced that this is one time where no one's gonna disagree with her. She gives some really good reasons for this. She says, um, kids hate it. She says, parents hate it. She says, teachers hate it. And then she gives some reasons. She gives us some facts as to, as to why it should be banned. She talks about, childhood obesity we do know that kids are getting more and more obese every year um, so we should let them run around so if they're doing homework they're sitting down aren't they they should be running around um, she then makes the point that kids who aren't um, sort of academically <coughs> good at school who spend their whole day at school feeling like oh my god I can't do this um, to make them then do that again at home is just cruel and they should be given time to find what does give them joy and what they are good at like playing football or writing music or uh, mending cars or cooking or whatever it happens to be. Uh, she then also talks about the fact that kids should be able to be kids and just spend time with their families. And then the last point she makes is that kids don't always have somewhere quiet to do their homework completely it's, it's really difficult to find a, a quiet space isn't it in your house to get anything done at all uh, without your brother and sister coming in or people coming around or parents or grandparents or whatever so it, it can be really difficult um, to actually find somewhere to do it and she says actually homework is a parent test isn't it the kids who get their homework done are the ones who've got parents who make them do it um, so she makes some really really good points but what we're going to look at is this uh, table this is what we're going to look at. So we're going to um, actually begin to annotate the article using structure, grammar, lexis, and meaning. Okay, so the one that I've um, uploaded to you already has some examples in here. 
Um, you don't have to use these, you can use your own examples. Um, but I think it's, it's really worth doing that. So the first thing we're going to look at is structure. So on here, how has she laid out the article? How do we know what she's going to be talking about? How does she warm us up for the main argument? And how does she stop this just being an unstructured rant? OK, so the examples I've given you when she says at the beginning, I dare to say the unsayable. She starts off by telling us um, crazy things that she has said, like fish are evil and jam is horrible and Father Christmas is sexy. We're like, what? what the hell is this crazy woman on about? And then she says, no one's going to disagree with me on this, though, because then she tells us what it is. Um, so in the effect box underneath, I want you to, you know, try and answer those questions. How does she warm us up uh, for what she's going to be talking about? Um, she sort of teases us, doesn't she? We're kind of expecting her to say something ridiculous. And then she says something that m makes us go, oh, OK, so this isn't completely off the wall. Let's see what she's got to say. Um, towards the middle of the article, she gives us loads of examples, loads of reasons. Um, she really builds up her argument with lots of well thought through reasons. Um, one quote that I quite liked was where she said, homework means our children never really leave. Oh, that says home, it should read school. Homework means our children never really leave school, which is true, doesn't it? Homework means our children never leave school. And then at the end she says, let's call homework what it really is. And she gets back to her point of saying, it's just um, a parent test. Okay, so that's the first um, the first bit on structure. How has she laid out the article? How do we know what she's going to be talking about? How does she warm us up? How does she stop it being a rant? So fill in your table and then we're going to look at grammar. Okay, so again, on the um, PDF, I've filled in a bit on, on the grammar here, but let's have a look at the questions. How does she use different sentence styles and lengths for effect? What about her use of subordinate clauses? So I put some work on that in a previous lesson. Do these make for a chatty tone? How has she used punctuation to make her ideas clear? So again, she starts off with a list. Jam is horrible, fish are evil, Father Christmas is the sexiest man alive. Um, it's kind of funny and engaging to, to, to start with a list. Um, different sentence lengths and different styles. Um, in the fifth paragraph, she uses a really long, complex sentence. I mean, have, have a look back through the article. It's really long. Um, so she, she contrasts that with lots of little short, sharp sentences to keep it interesting. And just varying your sentence length will do that. She has this uh, use of dialogue in here as well. I hate you and I want to die. Um, and she repeats that, doesn't she? Um, subordinate clauses are all over the place. Um, she sort of interjects, you know, well, you've got a sentence, then a comma, and then a subordinate clause, and then a comma, and then the rest of the sentence. And she sort of gives us her opinion. And it makes it quite chatty. It makes us want to engage with her. OK. Um, Lexis, just looking at the words she uses, how has she mixed up sophisticated vocabulary with informal vocabulary? Why has she done that? Has she chosen words carefully to create humour, perhaps exaggeration? Has she used direct address, I, you, me, we? Okay, so um, I picked up the very, very first sentence. She says, I'm not one for craven populism. That's very sophisticated vocabulary, isn't it? Craven populism. You've probably already Googled it. It means that she's just saying what she thinks people want to hear. If Sorry, if you are craven populism, if you are one for craven populism, then you would just say what you thought people would want to hear. She doesn't do that. She doesn't say what she thinks you want to hear. She tells you the truth. She gives you her own opinion. Um, OK, so she's basically saying I'm I'm not worried about offending or upsetting anyone because it's it's what I think. So craven populism is quite sophisticated vocabulary. Similarly, um, 
if you know in your bones that academia is not for you, academia just means being good at academic work, reading and writing and maths and science and that kind of stuff, rather than creative or, or physical, um, physical things. So uh, Craven Populism and Academia, I'm sure you can find lots of other examples of very formal language. But then she does mix it up. Pain in the neck, she uses, which is a, a, an idiom. It's a it's kind of slang, isn't it? She says, oh, teachers are all like, we'd kick it in the nuts, <laughs> which is terribly informal and, and slang. And then at the end, she says, it's a life vampire. Uh, homework is a life vampire. So she mixes it up, her formal and informal language. What's the, what's the effect of that? Does the slang, does the informal language make us like her, as if we're sort of chatting casually with her, makes her seem like more of a friend? But then we've got the formal, very formal language, which perhaps um, makes her seem like an expert. Oh, this woman actually knows what she's talking about. We tend to pay more attention to people who sound clever, don't we? The ones who use big words, yes? Basically, using posh words makes you sound like you know what you're talking about. So she's... She's, she's trod this very fine line between being our sort of chatty friend on one hand and then the expert on the other. Okay, I'm talking much too much. Uh, meaning, okay, look at imagery and cultural references. So she makes a few cultural references. Uh, how, how can you make kids care about Richard II on one side of A4? Um, this is true. Uh, one side of A4, we all know that that's, that's the paper that, that we write on, isn't it? Let me just get this uh, this back up for you here. Okay, um, so these cultural references have helped her get her meaning across. She's talked about one side of a football because we share that cultural reference. Um, the, the last thing she says, I hope the biggest dog in the world comes and eats it. That's that cultural reference, isn't it? The idea of, oh, sir, I haven't done my homework because my dog ate it. The dog ate my homework. That's something that is a cultural thing, isn't it? We know exactly what she means. But then we ha also have, if we go back to the PowerPoint here, some imagery. We've got some beautiful imagery in here. She talks about vivid, um, vivid evenings and vivid memories and lovely images of walking along the river and seeing your nan. And I thought that one of the nicest, saddest image was when she talks about a child doing their homework and she describes that sad chair at the kitchen table and the slow pen and the child's heart breaking. And there's some really powerful imagery which really helps to get her points across, doesn't it? So when you're filling in the effect box, these are the questions you need to answer. How does the writer want you to respond? Uh, are they trying to engage you by making you laugh, perhaps? Are they trying to just change the tone to keep you interested and to show that they can go from being your friend to being the expert, to convince you or to agree with them? Do they try and show you that they're the same as you? Are there things in here that she's referencing that you're like, oh yes, yeah, I, I, I can relate to that. Um, or is she trying to show you that she's got access to expert advice? So what is the effect on the reader? Is it designed to make us feel sad, feel sympathetic, feel empathetic? All of these things are done for a reason. Okay, last little bit I want you to have a, have a think about. Just going to give you some prompts for your own writing. So, four sentences I need you to write. I want you to answer how can you improve your writing using structure? Okay, so look back at this structure, the beginning, the middle, the end. Tease your audience, have some really detailed um, arguments and then wrap it up in a really clever and sophisticated way. How can you use grammar to improve your writing? Okay, again, so think about your sentence lengths, subordinate clauses, punctuation, mixing it up. What can you do with Lexis to create good writing? So I don't want you to use swear words, but some slang, some idioms, um, mixing up with very, very formal posh words. If you use very formal word of the week, you know, words the whole way through, great, but it becomes a little bit 
too the same, okay? You need to mix it up and keep us engaged and interested. And then lastly, how can you draw on the meanings created in your writing to improve the effectiveness of your article? Okay, so if you can make some cultural references, have some beautiful, powerful imagery in there, that would be really, really great and it would really help your writing. So four sentences, I want you to think about your own topic, whatever it is you've chosen to write about. Uh, the importance of planning. Okay, let's get rid of my face here. Okay, exam hacks. Okay, this is a brilliant planning sheet that Mrs. Nunnally put together. Planning sheet, planning sheet. <laughs> uh, so put your question in the middle box. Whatever it is that you've decided you're going to write about. I hate mobile phones. I hate YouTube. Um, I hate, I don't know what it is about the modern world that you hate. I'm interested to find out. Put that in the middle and then fill in the boxes around. We've got some starters. Imagine, so imagine world where mobile phones didn't exist. Or talk to the reader, my friend. I know that, blah, blah, blah. Uh, use pronouns. We must do this. It is our, okay? Do you remember we talked about that last time, didn't we? Move from I to you and then we. I think you expect we know. Verbs are incredibly important when writing a piece of nonfiction. Um, students cry and they weep at the idea of completing homework. Parents endure the pain of homework too. Uh, lists, uh, Catelyn Moran's used lots of lists. Pain, anguish, anxiety. Lots of rule of three. Don't forget your rule of three. Uh, and then you can raise the level of urgency and importance with modal verbs. So it's quite nice to start your piece of writing with things like could and might, and then finishing with must and have to, you know, finishing with some very, very bossy, powerful verbs at the end there to say that this is non-negotiable. Okay, what you've also got are some fabulous sentence starters here. Um, you have this PowerPoint as a PDF so you can have a look at these. Some brilliant sentence starters and some signposts for cohesion counter-arguing. It's a good idea to look at the other side of the argument. You know, some people might think this, but actually I think that, okay? And then the last thing that you need to do when you have written your article is you need to proofread it and edit it, okay? You need to make sure you've used the best kind of vocabulary you can. Oh, it says, look at the display. You're not in the classroom, you can't do that. Can you replace adjectives for more powerful ones? Can you improve any of your sentence starters? Okay, that's me talking for 27 minutes, Blah. right go away. I will send you some more information tomorrow for tomorrow's lesson. Good luck with this. Really good luck. I can't wait to read what you guys have done. I'll put all the instructions on show my homework. Um, enjoy ranting. Bye.